Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon and welcome to the latest episode of our entertainment show. As you know, we've been previewing and airing this month and for the previous months uh, in terms of our cult classic Into the Vault series where we look at iconic movies whether across the genres, whether it be romantic, whether it be fiction, whether it be horror, whether it be uh, action thrillers. And we look at from the 90s to 70s, to 80s, to noughties, and in, in the late 2020s. We're going back into the vault this week. We're going back to 2006, a movie directed by Martin Scorsese. It featured Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Roy Winstone, uh, to name a, Alec Baldwin, to Anthony Anderson, to name a few. But our special guest, she played a lead uh, female role in the movie, the one and only Kirsten Dalton. She played the character Gwyn. And just before we introduce Kirsten to you, just a bit of feature, The Departed was an undercover cop movie, movie that had a mole in the police uh, department and they were trying to infiltrate an Irish gang in South Boston. So there's a bit of that Irish element to our movie this week as well, uh, giving that sort of Irish, sort of Boston, sort of connections. And uh, first of all, Kirsten, great to have you on. Uh, great to speak to you. And uh, The Departed 2006... Do you still remember us? Do you still uh, have you to look back at it and say, uh, I was actually in that movie? Yes, it was a while ago, right? Um, yeah, no, it was a great honor to be in that movie. What an experience it was. It was just a spectacular experience all the way around. So ask away and I shall share. And I suppose, Kirsten, I'm just looking at the cast. I've mentioned seven or eight names. I could have gone on there with another seven or eight that I didn't mention in terms of who 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 starred in the film as well. Obviously, a Martin Scorsese movie, when you tried out for the audition for the sort of part, or I don't know if you were recommended for the sort of role by a talent agent. In terms of the script, when it came about, when you if you went in for a read for it, did you have an idea who was attached to the movie at the time? Or are you very much completely in the dark? Uh, yeah, I didn't know anything at all. Um, I had, uh, you know, I think I have Rebecca Broussard to thank for it. She was dating Jack Nicholson and the mother of two of his children, um, Raymond and Lorraine Nicholson. And she was doing a film a long time ago called Blue Champagne and invited me to be a part of that with her and Jennifer Nicholson. So that's where he first saw my work and actually, you know, got a hold of me and complimented me and said that, you know, complimented me on my acting. So that was very cool and super exciting to have that happen. And so um, then I was working on a television series called The Dead Zone, Stephen King, The Dead Zone in Canada. And um, my, it was my very last day on the set a uh, 24 hour shoot, 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. My husband at the time picked me up uh, from the set and I turned on my phone, which had been off for 24 hours. And there was a, just a ton of messages. And so what I finally came to find out was that through the grapevine that they had been casting in New York and trying to find someone um, maybe similar, similar to me and who was a bit sassy. And I guess I can be a bit sassy. And, um, I had to basically go from 24 hours of not sleeping longer, actually get on a plane, fly to LA. I immediately, my husband took me to get a suit at Barney's really quickly, got my hair done, had to be at the airport to catch a plane to New York, um, a studio plane. And, I got on the plane and I still hadn't slept. I was just a mess, which actually worked in my favor because I was so exhausted. I didn't have time to be nervous. Um, I was given a few um, pages of the character, but I didn't know anything about the movie or anyone who was attached, anything at all. So later in the flight, I'm walking back and I see Jack Nicholson and I sort of try to start up conversation and say like, oh, so can you tell me about this character or the script or who's in it? And, um, and he said something like fucking actresses. And I was like, oh, okay, bad time. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I didn't get any information there. 
and went back and basically I couldn't sleep. I got to New York, um, was in the hotel, sitting on a couch, kind of, you know, a, a few people who had worked for other people came, came and gave me little tidbits. And one of them was that the information I just said about being myself and how, um, you know, I can be sassy and clever and that what had happened with the other girls was as soon as they got to a point where they got into a fight or an argument with his character, he, his test was at the end, would his character kill them dead? Cause he kills everybody. So why wouldn't he kill her if she, you know, doesn't know how to be intelligent and clever in the way that she argues and fights and um, is still fun and, and, and all that. So that gave me a hint of, of the character and the clue. And then I was sitting there on the couch and I think I fell back and fell asleep right when this guy said, all right, they want you to come upstairs, the casting director, Ellen Lewis, um, Scorsese and Jack. And I went upstairs and um, I believe it was the Princess Diana suite at the Carlisle. And uh, we said hellos and everything. And apparently Scorsese had seen all my series on the Dead Zone and is a fan of the Dead Zone. So I thought that was very cool and unexpected. And then Jack left and said, okay, you guys have your meeting and your reading. I'm gonna come back. And, and I thought he said something to the effect of maybe we'll do a little improv when I came back. But he was, he was such a arse on the plane, you know, that when he came back um, after we were done, he kind of flicked the back of my head as he was walking around the couch to the meeting. So I took it upon myself to start the improv. And um, I kind of went off on him a little bit about just what a prick he had been on, you know, and what the fuck is his problem. And, you know, he's just, you know, we've got to bug up his ass. And, uh, and then I think I said something and I cannot remember to this day what it was, but um, I think it was bad because his face turned red and he got kind of sweaty and he was about to come for me and I could feel it. Like I was about to get, like he was gonna come for me verbally at, from Jack Nicholson. And I wanted to crumple up in a little ball. And um, instead I, I don't even know where I got it. It just came out beautifully and perfectly. This, I looked at him and I smiled and I was just like, damn, you look so fucking sexy when you get all pissed off like that. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly the words I said, but it worked. And he went from attack mode to big smile. And he was like, okay, we got something here. So um, I think that um, however that, sentence came out however I said it whatever I said exactly it worked in my favor so I was very fortunate there and Marty was just amazing and said that his daughter watched the show and stuff like that and um so I went back down to my room I mean to the waiting room wherever I was sitting and um I fell asleep just sitting there and they because I still hadn't slept and so that was what two days and um someone came with a script and a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses and said, you know, uh, they're gonna get you set up and you start, I, I think it was the next day I started, I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, that's how the story is. Okay, Kirsten, so you're probably one of, one of the last really signed up for the movie, so in terms of that. So obviously uh, the trick is if you're ever going for uh, an audition in terms of a Jack Nicholson movie obviously insults Jack Nicholson to the last <laughs> and obviously it'll work a treat <laughs> but uh, uh, Kirsten obviously working in that is not something I would normally do or suggest I don't know you know I was so tired <laughs> that um, everything just kind of fell together magically and uh, yeah but I don't think that's generally something I would have done uh, Kirsten, in obviously you said you're starting the next day and you turn up the next day and lo and behold, you see Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Mark Wahlberg, Anthony Anderson, Alec Baldwin. Uh, what are your sorts of thoughts? Were you saying, 
was another two words HS sort of going through your mind in terms of uh, a sort of a, an open sort of jaw expression in terms of what 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 this movie obviously when you saw that cast there in front of you think to thought to yourself wow I've, I've landed myself a big deal here uh yeah it was a, it was a big deal and um i think when i was first day walking to the set um actually with the the, the dialect coach because i didn't have that much time with him and he's the one who sort of helped me with the character and we were um going over some stuff walking to the set and somebody came up to me and said uh, said something that oh get ready for some um to do some maybe some improv when you get on set and i i was and then i started seeing all the other actors and i was just like i need to use the restroom for a moment please i'll be right back and i just had to go and definitely had to go and gather myself and uh yeah but what what a great set everybody was amazing but a lot of testosterone for sure and Gwen, uh, of course, obviously playing that character, Gwen, and you're sort of caught up with a, a mob and a, and a sort of mafia sort of story, and she's sort of cutting that line, uh, obviously. Did you, what way did you want to sort of portray her sort of character? Did you want to make her feisty, strong? Did you want to make her vulnerable in terms of weak, in terms of what way did you feel that you need to bring her across? You mentioned all this male testosterone. And she obviously has to stand out in that sort of environment as well. So how did you feel that you could get her punching above her weight? Um, right. You know, because you want to hold your own in this kind of situation. Uh, you know, the dialect coach uh, director for the dialect was very helpful in helping me with the character because he had a specific character in mind that he wanted the um, accent to be like. And he had done... A, hours and hours of um, recording of a specific woman that he gave me that I got to listen to in my earphones. And um, it, it was really cool because she was a super uh, Southie Boston girl and she had then her, her and her husband, her husband had made a lot of money since they were so broke. She was from a very poor, poor place. And then they had made a lot of money through whatever means, I have no idea. And so she was trying to put on airs uh, when people were around because now they have money. And she was trying to be a little bit fancy. So sometimes it would almost waver over to, you know, when someone is trying to be proper, uh, Connecticut, almost a tint of. And then as I'd listen for hours, he would just record her and have these conversations. And she would get more relaxed as she was with him. And when she'd get mad or when after she started drinking, she was drinking these strawberry daiquiris um, in the recording and her accent would come out more. So I was really excited about in the scene work. We had a, um, a lot of the scenes started out where she was being fancy and trying to be, you know, proper and have her hair and, um, up in a scarf. And then they'd get in this little fight and the scarf would come off and then she'd get mad and then the accent would come out more and then they'd make up and get, you know, all happy. And, you know, um, um, there would be a, a great arc in every scene. Unfortunately, a lot of that didn't make it into the film. So there's either just the beginning or the middle of end little pieces. And, um, but that, that really um, flavored so much of, you know, what I knew I was going to do and how I was going to sort of uh, settle up on, on set. And Kirsten, obviously, it's a feisty sort of movie. It's action intense. It's a sort of geared towards more an older teen, maybe male adolescents or, or sort of audience. In terms of some of those more, you mentioned intimate scenes. Uh, was that had you done some of those before in the past? Was it a bit nerve wracking? Obviously, there was nothing too over the top in it, but at still at the same time, was this, uh, uh, dare I say, was it was it a bit daunting coming from the dead zone and obviously being thrown into something like that? Um, 
I'd done a lot of those scenes. So, um, you know, I was kind of ready and I knew that his character was the Whitey Bulger character. And I knew I had read the books and knew the history that he had a younger girlfriend. But I think Jack didn't want me to be as young as Whitey's girlfriend was. So they were, they were doing some stuff with me with frosting the hair a little bit and um, working with light layers of latex. And then I knew that part of the reason this character was even written in was to give his character, Jack Nicholson's character, more depth as a mob boss, you know, to sort of complete that picture. And so my job was basically to be that somebody who he could hang with and that wouldn't upset him, but, you know, lifted. And I knew as far as any sort of sex stuff that was going to happen, it was going to be mad. And I, you know, I had to be completely free and just go with whatever you know was going to happen so i i was ready and definitely in the long version of the film there's more um that goes on it, that it kind of implies <laughs> in what was left at the end okay and kirsten obviously you're around this sort of cast and there's all, all obviously moments in between takes and long sort of shoots a day do you get to interact much with Anthony Anderson, with uh, Alec Baldwin, with Mark Wahlberg, uh, aside from, obviously most of your parts are with Jack, but you get to in, in, in line with those sorts of characters uh, during between takes. And do you get to share a sort of a bond and any sort of good fun stories? We all know Anthony Anderson and Alec are sort of funny guys to begin with. Yeah, Alec, I was on... Um... I, I, how did I hang out with him? Was he on the plane? I think he was sat next to me on the plane and um, he's just hysterical and so much fun and full of energy. Really great guy. He was wonderful on set. Um, at one point, um, Jack Nicholson had called my husband back in LA and said, um, I'm going to fly you to, you know, there's a plane coming to New York, come and, and be here with, with Kristen. There's a lot of testosterone on the set. People are gonna think things about me and her. So I think you should be here with your wife. And my husband was like, nah, she can handle herself. And so um, he kind of asked, I believe the story I heard is that he asked uh, David O'Hara to sort of chaperone me a little bit, which was hysterical. She took very seriously. And uh, when we would go out and I hung out a lot with him and Ray Winstone when we go out at night or weekends and whatever. And he was very protective and didn't let anyone talk to me. <laughs> um, uh, so that was great. And I'm still good friends with some of the people from the set. On set, um, working with Leonardo, he was super cool. We spent quite a few days up there in the penthouse scene and um, he was very respectful and good to me and we had great conversations and he was fun to work with. Um, Matt Damon, I feel like was just a superstar. You know, he was working his ass off on and off the set on the weekends because that's how Jack looks like he liked to work. He would go work with the directors on the weekends and really work their butts off and was um, super respectful. Uh, a lot of the other guys I didn't really um, have a lot of interactions with, but those are my stories. And Kirsten, obviously the movie release and the premiere and the de debut, did you get to see a private sort of screening with all the cast and a cast sort of rap uh, before uh, the movie went to the premiere? And what was the sort of premiere like for you? Was it a doll and glitz? Was it a sort of a real sort of showpiece occasion with family and sort of loved ones around and their initial sort of reactions? Um, I, what I did get to see a screening before and I was just, I just thought it was amazing. It was like, it was about three hours and something hours long, the, the version that I saw, which was sort of just, uh, friends, uh, screening. And then I wasn't really told that, uh, they had to cut the movie down from three hours, I believe to two hours or two hours and 10 minutes, something like that. And, um, I took my girlfriend to New York, uh, Zarima, and we uh, attended the premiere. And um, it, it was definitely, I, a lot of my stuff had, had, wasn't in there anymore that I had seen in the screen. So it was a little bit of a surprise. And um, Scorsese was really cool. He came up to me afterwards and he said, they just want, wanted you to know, you know, gave me a lot of compliments and said um, that uh, they put me back in. Because at one point what had happened is they had said, 
they had taken me out. So this was what happened. They, they were completely supposed to cut me out. And so he said they had completely cut me out of the movie 100%. And then he said, they put me back in and he said, and I was like, Oh, I'm so happy. He said, and Scorsese said, please understand. Um, we had to make the movie short enough so they could have enough showings or whatever. And, you know, of course I'm the least famous person in the film. So I was, I understood 100%. And then it was, I believe Brad Gray on the plane coming home was the one who came up to me and he said, what, how it happened is that they tested the film multiple times. And, um, when they cut me out, it didn't test as well. And they kept retesting it and retesting it with different aud audiences and it didn't test as well. So they put my character back in as minimally as they could, um, but still left it in because it then, and then they tested again and it went back up, tested better. So my, my character being in the film made the movie test better. And so I was, I thought that was pretty cool. And it was cool of him just to come and tell me and give me such, you know, compliments and things like that. that I held my own and all that kind of stuff. So it was a good experience. I mean, it was an incredible, amazing experience. And Kirsten, you're obviously an accomplished actor at the time, but obviously being in a blockbuster movie like that, and obviously all the drama, all the attention, all the premieres that goes on, did it, having that on your CV, did it open doors for you uh, in terms of, was it after that, the next nine months, was it absolutely crazy and were scripts coming at you left, right and center, uh, some of them that you passed on this, you actually saw made, made up a movie and you saw oh, you regret passing on on them and said, and you see someone act as playing that role. Is it that was actually I got offered that first, but you know. Uh, so that on that set was four weeks we shot in New York and we shot four weeks in Boston. So it was eight weeks. And I was asked to keep it a secret. Um, so I didn't tell anybody and I'm, um, my managers and agents were ex instructed to not tell anybody as well. And then all of a sudden when they said, okay, you can tell people, um, I didn't really have sort of a system in place. You know, I didn't have PR people. I also had a lot of social anxiety. And so I didn't do many interviews or I had such bad social anxiety. I would do terrible, usually at castings. That's why I said it worked so well in my favor, being so exhausted. And um, so um, I was, would get a lot of jobs just from word of mouth. And um, I didn't, I don't think anybody even knew. I think there, I think there was one photograph of me at the premiere with my um, girlfriend, Zarima, and it said that she was me. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I, you know, I did get work. I mean, I continued to work, but I wouldn't say that it, um, you know, I was getting thrown tons of scripts. I don't think anyone knew who I was and I didn't do any promotion at all. I did zero promotion. I didn't, I don't think I did any interviews. I think later, maybe a, um, a couple of obscure interviews on accident with people who I knew I did, but I've never done an interview about it really. Well, you mentioned Kirsten social anxiety there, and obviously that's that's uh, as the trend, and we're obviously aware of what that entails. But obviously, did you feel a sort of freedom in an actress in? Because obviously, with social anxiety, you're sort of free, you're sort of conscious and nervous. But you were able to do intimate scenes and stuff like that, even with social anxiety. So it's actually it's uh, it's uh, the norm. Just playing sort of characters, or, or fictional or sort of characters, made you sort of get away from that sort of social anxiety that you can do certain things like that? 100%. Being a character, especially I feel more like I um, thrive more as a character actress. Um, and it definitely gives me a kind of freedom when um, I'm playing a character that allows me to be something that would be, you know, more terrifying for myself. Um, also, you know, I did what a lot of people do back in back then was dealt with it with alcohol and drugs and all kinds of things to sort of get me through the day. And, um, you know, so now I've just sort of dealt with all of that and uh, in a much better place. So I can look back and just be proud of the stuff that I have done and, and see you know, how I was struggling and dealing with certain things at the time. 
but yeah, and it was all so exciting and so much fun. It, it was some of it's a blur. Well, uh, Kirsten Dalton, finally looking at the departed and looking at your role and uh, character as Gwen, obviously in this week's uh, Into the Vault uh, movie series. Uh, how would you describe your memories? And is there a particular sort of moment now for the final minute or so in terms of an interaction between cast members or uh, a sort of funny blooper or funny memory to you in terms of story that's unique to you that sort of stands out that you'd always remember? Maybe it's an interaction with some someone or, or on any given day to you to say, wow, that's unique, that's personal to me, and it still makes me laugh or brings a smile to my face when I think about my time filming The Departed. I don't think there's a moment that I don't smile and laugh when I think about filming The Departed. I mean, what a magical time, what a magical cast, what a magical experience on a daily basis. It was so exciting every single day, every single moment. And just being around that much talent, I was trying to just soak, soak it all in as much as you can and, you know, watch what everybody was doing. And it was thrilling. Of course, it's thrilling and exciting and wonderful. There's certain songs you hear that bring you back to that moment. There's, you know, just all of it. It was spectacular and being part of, um, I feel like it's a part of history with all the work awards that it's won and with that group of people. And I feel extraordinarily lucky and blessed. On that too. note, uh, Kirsten Dalton, uh, pleasure. Thanks for joining us uh, there this evening. Uh, great uh, appearances as well by uh, uh, Freddie Mercury as well as starring oh. all uh, uh, Indians view as well, pretty uh, thumbs up before we say uh, goodbye to Kirsten Dalton for this evening. Kirsten Dalton played the character Gwen in The Departed in 2006 alongside Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson, Mark Wahlberg, Ray Winstone, Anthony Anderson and Alec uh, Baldwin to name a few. Uh, an iconic Mar Martin Scorsese movie, won multiple awards, Oscars as well. Uh, Kirsten Absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. It's great to see that you're doing so well and full of life at the moment. And uh, we wish you all the best in your future endeavours. Thank you so much. Mwah.